Good evening, everyone. Thank you very much for coming to listen to God's Word. As always, I am delighted to see you, and I say that very sincerely. It's a 721. I have an announcement to make. I want to make it very clearly. This coming Sabbath afternoon, we will, I spoke to the pastor, we will conduct what is called an anointing service. It will be for those who are sick. When I say sick, I don't mean a snuffy nose or a bad temper or something. I mean sick. But there are some spiritual preparations that must be made if you desire to be included in that service. Here are the preparations. One, confession of sin. You must do that. Two, if you have wronged someone, you must contact the person if possible and apologize and say, I'm sorry. Three, if someone has wronged you and you have stubbornly refused to forgive that person, you must contact that person and say, I forgive you. Those are the three conditions to participate in that service. Let me repeat them. One, confession. If there's something you know you're doing that's wrong, you just know it is wrong. Confess it, stop. Not just to be part of the service, but stop because sin is death. Two, if you have done someone something wrong and you have not yet apologized, call that person, preferably face to face if you can, and say, I did you wrong, I am sorry. The Spirit of God has touched me this week, forgive me. And it may be the person right next to you in that bed, your husband or your wife. Three, if someone has wronged you, you are innocent as a goose, but you have refused to forgive that person, you ask God for the divine courage to go to the person and say, you wronged me, here's how I suffered, but God has touched my heart and I forgive you, God bless you. Those three things. If you do not do those three things, you cannot participate in that service. Now, if you say you did them, we won't check your background. We have to take your word. But God will know whether you actually did them or not. It's a very frightening thing to uh, come into God's presence for a service like this, not having made the right preparation. So if you are seriously ill, we want to anoint you according to James 5, 14 to 16. Is any sick among you? Let him call for the elders of the church. And let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith shall save the sick. And the Lord shall raise him up. And if he hath committed sins, they shall be forgiven him. Confess your faults one to another. And pray for one another that ye may be healed. The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. I will repeat that tomorrow morning, tomorrow evening, Friday morning, Friday evening, Sabbath morning, and on Sabbath afternoon, we'll have the service very simple. We will anoint you with oil on the forehead and then ask God to do his will in your life. Is that clear? All right. Please turn off your cell phones. I, hope, I believe you've already done that. But if someone is with us for the first time, you may not be aware that we have a very strict law. All cell phones must be turned off. Favor number two. Now, not just turn down, turn off. Let me tell you why. If you turn your phone down or you put it on vibrate, if it vibrates, curiosity will compel you to look to see who is calling you. When you look to see who's calling, the person next to you on either side will look to see what you're looking at, you see, and that will cause a disturbance. So please, just out of respect for God, and just to be kind to a guest thousands of miles from home, turn the phones off until they are dead. Favor number two, while I'm speaking, pray for me, and say, Lord, put your words in that man's mouth. And favor number three, please think. You've been coming from my tonight. I hope you realize every night you come and you listen to the word of God, you are required by God to make a decision. 
to make some changes in your lives. So please don't come, listen, and leave the same way. Make decisions. Ask God for help to make some changes in the life. Second Peter chapter 3, verse 18 says, But grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And that growth comes about as we listen to God's word, we compare our lives with his word, we make confession, we ask for power, we try to step up in godly living. All right, let's bow our heads and pray. Our Father in heaven, we thank you so much today, God, for this opportunity we have to come before you to listen to your word and in listening to worship you. We ask today, God, to receive us now because of Christ and also because you love us. I pray that you would grant me the words, clear words, direct words, compassionate words. Help me to speak, dear Father, simply that even the children may understand. I humble myself before you, dear God. Cleanse my heart that I may be a fit vessel to do this very, very serious work. Let the Spirit take the spoken word, Father, and apply it to every heart that is listening within the building or without. And at the end of this service, Father, let many decisions be made to draw closer to your divine bosom. I offer this prayer from my heart. In Jesus' name, amen. Our subject for this evening, a comprehensive test. What did I say? A comprehensive test. Go with me to Genesis chapter 2. We will read verses 16 and 17. By now you are very familiar with that passage of Scripture. Genesis chapter 2, verses 16 and 17. We're reading from the King James Version. Genesis 2, 16, 17. The Bible says, And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden thou mayst freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil thou shalt not eat of it, for in the day thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. Observe a key word in verse 16. And the Lord God commanded the man. Now the word command or commanded appears directly three times in the first three chapters of Genesis. In chapter 2, verse 16, and the Lord God commanded the man. In chapter 3, uh, verse uh, 11, God said, Who told thee that thou wast naked? Hast thou eaten of the tree of which whereof I commanded thee, saying, Thou thou shalt not eat of it? That's Genesis 3, verse 11. And in verse 17, also of chapter 3, and unto Adam he said, Because thou hast eaten of the, I hearken unto the voice of thy wife and has eaten of the tree of which I commanded thee, saying, Thou shalt not eat of it. Now, when God gave Adam a test, this test was based on a command. Now, Adam, being our father, the test for him is the test for us. I believe I told you, I may have, I don't recall, Adam did not ask to be made. He opened his eyes and there he was. In a perfect world, God does not require us to serve him by force or compulsion. He gives us an opportunity to decide whether or not we will serve him. And so God gave that opportunity to Adam via a test. If you want to continue to live in a perfect environment, Adam, obey me. If you disobey, that will be your signal to me that you prefer to live in a less than perfect environment. Let me repeat that. The condition for remaining in a perfect environment was obedience to God. Our subject is a comprehensive test. And so the Bible says, and the Lord God commanded the man. Adam was tested in the area of the will. Now God could have said, Adam, let me see how high you can jump. Let me see how long you can hold your breath underwater. God didn't do that. God tested him, I repeat, in the area of the will. The will is that aspect of us where we decide. So when the Bible tells us in Daniel chapter 1 verse 8, but Daniel purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself with the portion of the king's meat, nor with the wine which he drank, that took place in the will. In Genesis chapter 11 verse 4, the Bible says, 
and they said, Go to, let us build us a city and a tower whose top may reach unto heaven, and let us make us a name, lest we be scattered abroad upon the face of the whole earth. And the God came down to see the city and the tower which the children of men built. Verse 6 of Genesis 11, And the Lord said, Behold, the people is one, and they have all one language, and this they begin to do, and now nothing will be restrained from them which they have imagined to do. They acted in the way we will build a city and a tower in opposition to God, an expression of the will. Obedience to God is an expression of the will. Disobedience to God is an expression of the will. The one area of our lives God desires to control with our permission is the will. This is how Satan controls our lives, by controlling the will. And he can only control that will if we cede it to him. And so I say again, God set up a test based on command. But let us read Psalm 33. We read verses 6 and 9. Let's take a closer look at this issue of command. Psalm 33, verses 6 and 9. Our subject is a comprehensive test. It's already 733. The Bible says, by the word of the Lord were the heavens made, and all the host of them by the breath of his mouth. Verse 9, for he spake, and it was done. He commanded, and it stood fast. The world was created by command. Follow me closely. Let no one distract you. Creation is the result of command. Let's go to Isaiah 45, let's read verse 12. Our subject is a comprehensive test. Isaiah 45, verse 12. I have made the earth and created man upon it. I, even my hands, have stretched out the heavens, and all their hosts have I commanded. We have two texts that tell us creation is by command. Let's go to Psalm 148, reading verses 1, 2, and 5. Psalm 148, verses 1, 2, and 5. Do you have that passage? The Bible says, Praise ye the Lord. Praise ye the Lord from the heavens. Praise him in the heights. Praise him all his angels. Praise him all his hosts. Verse 5. Let them praise the name of the Lord, for he commanded, and they were created. We have the third verse that tells us creation was by command. Let's go to 2 Corinthians chapter 4, reading verse 6. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, reading verse 6. Do you have that? The Bible says, For God who commanded the light to shine out of darkness has shined in our hearts. We have a fourth verse. When God said, let there be light. And by the way, which member of the Godhead said, let there be light? Jesus Christ. Ah, God bless you. Accurate recall. When Christ said, let there be light, Paul tells us that was a command. Now, by way of extension, listen to verse 6. And God said, let there be a firmament in the midst of the waters. What was that? Come on, come on. What was that? A command. You must speak with confidence even if you're wrong. Are you with me? Always speak with confidence. Now, verse uh, 9. Let the waters under the heavens be gathered together unto one place. What was that? Command. Verse 11. Let the earth bring forth grass. Verse 14. Let there be light in the firmament of the heaven. What was that? Verse 20, let the waters bring forth abundantly the moving creature that hath life. What was that? Command, command, command. My brothers and sisters, creation was by command. And who spoke the commands? Jesus. Jesus. Can you say amen for Jesus? Amen. He created by command. Now, we also found out last night that the same person who creates is the same person who does what? Ah, sustains, sustains, yes. I'm really delighted you're speaking back to me. God bless you for that. 
it must be a great strain on you, but please suffer the strain and continue talking back to me. The same person who creates is the person who sustains. But we also said that the same word that creates is the same word that sustains. So if the word that creates is a command, what sustains? A command. Which means creation is made and sustained by command. Or law, if you want a shorter word. This is extremely significant. Now let us look at the order of creation. Day one, what did God make? Day two, firmament. Day three, vegetation. Day four, sun, moon, and stars. Day five, birds of the air, fish of the sea. Day six, land animals and mankind. God's last act of creation for the world was mankind. Which means, when Adam opened his eyes, he found himself in a world made by what? And sustained by what? Command. Is that clear? Well, somebody say yes. yes. <laughs> he found himself in a world, a creation, made by command and sustained by command. Birds of the air, fish of the sea. Day six, land animals and mankind. God's last act of creation for the world was mankind. Which means, when Adam opened his eyes, he found himself in a world made by what? And sustained by what? Command. Is that clear? Well, somebody say yes. <laughs> he found himself in a world, a creation, made by command and sustained by command. Now, how comprehensive is this idea of creation by command, maintenance by command? Let's delve into a little science. It will be simple. The whole world, the whole universe is made up of what? Give me one word. It begins with an M, it has two T's. It has an A, an E, and an R. How many more clues do you need? The whole universe is made up of what? Give me one word. Matter. Now matter is generally broken up into solid, liquid, and gas. Now you may say uh, Bose-Einstein condensates or fermionic condensates or plasma, but essentially solid, liquid, and gas. Listen to me carefully. Everything created comes under law. Let's take solids. Do solids behave a certain way, yes or no? Yes. Do liquids behave a certain way? Yes. Do gases behave a certain way? Let's take the three states of matter, but the same chemical composition. Let's take water. We have water, that's liquid. We have ice, that's solid. And what's the gas form? Vapor. If you put ice in a glass, does it assume the shape of the glass, yes or no? No, because a solid does not do that. Are you with me? The solid resists any change in its shape. If you convert that ice to water, does it take the shape of the container? Yes, the part of the container that it fills up. Are you with me? All right. Now you change that water to gas. Does it take the entire shape? Yes. They behave differently, but chemically they are the same. Lost solids, liquids, and gas, they all obey laws. Now I, by God's grace, I fly a lot. Always on a plane. Eight hours, 10 hours, 14 hours, sometimes 16 hours on a plane. There is a law called Bernoulli's Principle. 
which says, when an object is moving through a fluid, what is a fluid? Give an example of a fluid. Or air is a fluid. When an object moves through a fluid, the pressure under the object is greater than the pressure above the object. And so the greater pressure underneath forces the object up. That's one of the reasons why a plane can fly. Notice I said one of the reasons, not the only one. That's a law. There's a law that says when a gas is heated, what does it do? It's expands, but yes, it rises, it expands. There are laws that govern solids, liquids, and gases, and those three headings, they refer to all of the universe, which is called matter. Our subject is a comprehensive test. Now, all of matter behaves. That's what the scientists say. How does a solid behave? How does a liquid behave? How does a gas behave? The word is behavior. How does matter behave? All right. Now let's take humanity. Are we solid, yes or no? Do you have bones? Are we solid? Yes. Are we liquid? Do we have blood? Do we have lymphatic fluid? We are liquid. Are we gas? Is there oxygen in your lungs? Some carbon dioxide and other gases? Yes. We are solid. We are liquid. We are gas. Which means, on that basis alone, we come under what? Come on, tell me. Law. Now, those of you who do deep sea diving, you've heard of the bends. Now, the bends can kill a diver if he or she ascends too quickly, because I think it's the, a certain gas, maybe the nitrogen, begins to expand if that person ascends too quickly. That gas is obeying a law. We are solid, liquid gas, and so we come under the laws that govern the physical world. Listen to Ellen White, Thought from the Mount of Blessing, page 48, paragraph 1. Everything in nature, from the moat in the sunbeam to the worlds on high, is under law. What is a moat in a sunbeam? Here's what it is. Tomorrow morning, when you open your window and the sunlight comes streaming in, you notice little things floating in the light? Each one of those little things is a moat. Listen to inspiration. Everything in nature, from the moat in the sunbeam to worlds on high, is under law. And upon obedience to these laws, the order and harmony of the natural world depends. So there are great principles of righteousness to control the life of all intelligent beings and upon conformity to these principles, the well-being of the universe depends. What she is doing, she splits the universe into two levels, the physical and the moral. Now I said every, everything in the universe, matter, behaves a certain way. But when God made man, he said, let us make man in our image. Image is character. Follow me closely. And character can only be judged as people observe our what? Behavior, whether it's physical behavior or behavior of speech. As they watch us, as they listen to us, our expression of ourselves, that gives clue to what our character is. Character must also behave. But character is not solid, liquid, nor gas. But it has to behave. And behavior must be guided by law. So the physical laws that govern solids cannot govern the character. The physical laws that govern liquids cannot govern the character. The physical laws that govern solids or gas cannot govern the character because character is not solid, nor liquid, nor gas. But since character behaves, it must come under law. That is God's arrangement. And the law that governs character is the law of the Ten Commandments. 
because everything is under law. Who arranged that? Give me one name. Jesus, the creator. Let's go back to Adam now, having taken that excursion into science. Adam opened his eyes, found himself in a system based on command, brought into existence by command, maintained by command, and the creator says to Adam, to fit into that system, I will test you on your attitude to command. Of every tree of the garden, thou mayest freely eat, a moral command. Adam, if you obey, you fit in, you belong. You disobey, you don't belong. Patriarchs and Prophets, page 522, paragraph 3, God is the life giver. From the beginning, all his laws were ordained to life, but sin broke in upon the order God had established, and discord followed. And so when Adam sinned, he went against the system Jesus as creator had set up, and that system was based on command or law. Let me say that again. When Adam sinned by disobeying God's command, he went completely opposite to the system God had set up, and any diversion from God's system is a threat to that system. Listen again, all his laws were ordained to life. Violation of that law then must introduce what? Death. Disorder. Chaos. Decay. God said to Adam, here's a command. When Adam sinned and God came down, Verse 9 of Genesis 3, the Bible says, And the Lord God called unto Adam and said unto him, Where art thou? And he said, I heard thy voice in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, and I hid myself. And he said, Who told thee that thou wast naked? Hast thou eaten of the tree, whereof I commanded thee that thou shouldst not eat? What God was saying, Did you do what I told you not to do? Or to reduce it to a few words, Did you, give me one word, Disobey. Who said that? Ah, God bless you, my attractive sister. Did you disobey? That's the key. In verse 17, God says the same thing. This time not at a question, but a statement. And unto Adam he said, Because thou hast hearkened unto the voice of thy wife, and hast eaten of the tree, uh, and hast disobeyed. Cursed is the ground for thy sake. Curses came upon the earth because a command was broken. In a system based on law, any diversion is dangerous. So Adam sinned, which means sin is going contrary to God's command. That's the root definition of sin, and we find that root in the first three chapters of Genesis. Sin is going contrary to God's command. Or 1 John 3 verse 4 tells us, sin is the transgression of the law, and we see that in the experience of Adam. Now, the Bible says in Revelation 21 verse 1, this is John the Revelator looking down into the future. He has a vision given to him by Christ, by the way, the same creator. And he said, and I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth were passed away, and there was no more sea. John sees a new heaven and a new earth. God has to get rid of this heaven and this earth. Why? Because what happened? Sin. And what is sin? Disobedience. Because of disobedience, Christ has to destroy this world, destroy the heavens associated with the world, and start all over again. This time with people who are obedient. 
Let me put it this way. When Christ, when Jesus created first, at the first time, he created people last. Are you with me? He made them last. So they opened their eyes and found themselves in a system they did not choose. This time, through the gospel, he is making people first. Are you following me? He is making them first. And what is he making them? Obedient. And another word for that is righteous. Because righteousness is obedience to God's law, plain and simple. He is making people righteous. In other words, he is asking through the gospel, do you want to live in a world where everything obeys? And when we say yes by surrendering the life, Jesus says, all right, I will prepare a place for you in that world. He is making people first. He is fitting them, then having made them and sealed them in that decision, he then makes the perfect world and puts perfect people. He is not doing it the way he did it the first time, making the world first and then having people cause problems. My brothers and sisters, the comprehensive test was obey or disobey. Now, if you are preparing for a physics exam, do you study geography? What do you study? Physics. Listen to the wise man, Ecclesiastes chapter 12, verses 13 and 14. Let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. Let's pause. Well, let's go on, then I'll come back. For God shall bring every work into judgment with every secret thing, whether it be good or whether it be evil. The wisest man who ever lived tells us, in the judgment, the standard God will use will be the law. James chapter 2 verse 12, so speak ye and so do as they that shall be judged by the law of liberty. In other words, James, who was a brother of Christ, says, live as though you are aware that one day you will be judged by the law. Now, if the judgment is based on the law and we are preparing for the judgment, should we not focus on God's law? If you are preparing for a physics exam, should you not study physics? And if we're preparing for a judgment based on the law, should we not be aware of God's law and ask ourselves, is my life in conformity with the standard that will be used in the judgment? But here's what Satan has done with the help of ministers. Ministers have gotten into the pulpit and preached, there is no law. Satan has been so successful. Most Christians believe it is not necessary to keep the law. A system set up by Jesus whom they love so much. When you adopt that thinking, which is dangerous, you fail to prepare yourselves for that event called the judgment. It's like someone preparing for a physics exam by studying gardening. Let me interject this very quickly. The law is not an instrument of salvation. It is an instrument of preservation. It preserves what is created. And Jesus set up a system of law and command. The system functions in heaven. Listen to Psalm 103, verse 20. Bless the Lord, ye his angels that excel in strength, that do his commandments, hearkening unto the voice of his word. The angels in heaven obey the same commands God came down on Sinai to proclaim to the Israelites. That's why when we pray the Lord's Prayer, we say, Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. 
Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. How? On earth, how? As it is in heaven. Because God's will is his law. What does the wise man say? This is the whole duty of man. The Bible says the commandments are the whole duty of man. There is nothing God requires of you that falls outside of the Ten Commandments. The problem is our minds are so limited we cannot get to the depth of the law because the law is an expression of the righteousness of God himself. And who can exhaust God? And so Psalm 119 verse 96 says, I have seen an end of all perfection, and the commandment is exceeding broad. For instance, the commandment that says, thou shalt not kill. For most people, that means no physical murder. Jesus came and said, no, if you're angry with your brother, that's murder. So he presented a depth of the commandment the Pharisee had never considered. God's law is broad and deep. It governs the thoughts, it governs the speech, it governs the physical behavior. And when you come to Christ, he puts that law exactly where sin begins, the heart. And I will write my law in their hearts because sin begins in the heart. Matthew chapter 12, verse 35, Jesus says, A good man out of the good treasure of his heart bringeth forth good things, and an evil man out of the evil treasure bringeth forth evil things. It is all the heart. And where sin originates is where God puts his law. So the moment sin stirs, the slightest tremor of a movement, the law shines a light on it, and the child of God knows that's wrong. I can take this whole message and express it in one statement. This is it. No law, no life. Let me say it again. No law, no life. Patriarchs and Prophets, page 49, paragraph 1, we read these very, very powerful words. God placed man under law as an indispensable condition of his very existence. And who was the God? Who was the Creator? Jesus, Jesus placed mankind under law as a condition not just for life, but for existence. You see, there's a, there, there must be a difference between existence and life. Thoughts from the Mount of Blessing, page 61, paragraph 2, listen carefully. God is the fountain of life, and we can have life only as we are in communion with him. Separated from God, existence may be ours for a little time, but we do not possess life. Uh, you didn't get it. You didn't hear what I just said. So I didn't hear anyone groan. I didn't hear anyone say, ouch. Let me say it again. God is the fountain of life. And we can have life only as we are in communion with him, separated from God. Existence may be ours for a little time, but we do not possess life. Question for you, don't answer me. Are you existing or living? No law, no life. And even existence will cease where there's no law. Because even a corpse is under law. Are you with me? A corpse is under law, no longer living, but existing, but under law, because it is still physical. When a car rusts, it rusts according to chemical laws. Are you following me? When you take a banana and take your long fingernail and draw a, and cut into the banana with your nail, you put it down for 20 minutes, you come back, what happens? It is brown, because a chemical process takes place that changes the color. Everything is under law. The only person not under law is God. That does not make God lawless. It simply means God can't be bound by law. But God is not lawless. All laws flow from God. Are you with me? But God is so... What's the word for God? 
awesome, massive, huge, gigantic. He spills over the universe. He cannot be bound by law. We are. Creation is not God. But God is the source of law. You know why we get sick? We violate the laws of health. We either don't rest enough, we work too hard, we don't exercise, we eat the wrong things, or we eat the right things but eat too much of it. <laughs> My brothers and sisters, God has given to us a comprehensive test. That test is the test of obedience. To fit into the system Christ set up, God told Adam, obey. To live in a system based on law, a person must be law-abiding. And Adam sinned for 6,000 years. There has been chaos, discord, crime, disease, war, famine, plagues, extermination of species, everything horrible, a whole shopping list of horrible outcomes as a result of one act of disobedience. The gospel's purpose can be expressed this way. The gospel is God's way to restore us to harmony with a system based on law. Because sin is a violation of law. The gospel delivers us from, you see, the Bible says in uh, Matthew 121, the angel told Joseph, and she shall bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sin. What is sin? The transgression of the law. If you're saved from sin, you are saved from transgressing the law. If you're saved from transgressing the law, what are you saved to? Some smart person tell me. You're safe from disobedience to obedience. obedience. Through the power of Christ. No sinner can obey unless the power of Christ aids him or her. Now, you and I can go through the motions, but to obey God's law, the letter and the spirit, we need Christ. To obey the letter, you may not need Christ. To obey the letter and the spirit, we need Christ. And through the power of Christ, the one who set up the system, he, through the Spirit, comes into us. And he gives us the power to live in harmony with the system he established, which our first father violated. My brothers and sisters, this comprehensive test is simply this. Will you live in harmony with my law? And the law was ordained to life. It is sin that brought death. Disobedience brings death. So if there's someone listening to me, you are resisting the concept of obedience and law. You are resisting life. Listen to me again. Before sin, Adam obeyed. All of nature obeyed. There was life. There was harmony. Disobedience brought death. It did then, and it will do it now. Let's make up our minds to pass the test. My brothers and sisters, Ask God to give to you and to me a heart that loves to obey him. What does the Bible say about Jesus when he was coming onto this earth? I delight to do thy will, O my God, yea, thy law is within my heart. Do you know when God puts, you know, it's, it's four minutes after, can I have ten minutes? I can. We finish at 8.15, I'll try. But if I go a little longer, it's your fault, remember. When God writes his law in your heart, I've told you before, the physical world has spiritual lessons, am I right? I told you that. Now, what's the function of the heart at a physical level? Pump blood. It's a sophisticated pump. It pumps blood. I read that because I got a book from the Oriental Watchman Publishing House about the heart. Cute little book. I loved it a lot. And I plan to read it on the plane back home. Now, the heart pumps blood. But the Bible says that the blood carries what? Give me one word life listen to me let's go from the physical to the spiritual jesus says out of the abundance of the heart what happened the mouth speaketh when god spoke the commandments on sinai he spoke from his heart are you with me 
Elvis says, the laws that every human agent are to obey flow from the heart of infinite love. When he spoke the law, he spoke from his heart. The law originates in the heart of God. So that was his heart. Now, that law, God takes and writes in us. He puts it in us. When God puts his law in you, he puts his heart in you. When God puts his heart in you in the form of his law of life, and that heart begins to beat, whose life is it pumping through you? God's life. God's life. When his law of life is in your heart, by your invitation and his response, it pumps spiritually his life. Now, the blood goes to how many parts of the body? Everywhere. Which means when the life of God is pumped in you and me, should it affect the way we do business? Yes or no? Our social life, hmm? Our, the way we handle money, the way we behave in church. Every aspect of the life must be affected because the pump, the law of God, pumps his life to the furthest peripheral extremes. God wants his life in you and me. He offers us his heart when he offers us his law. And the only thing he puts in the heart is the law. He does not put the church manual. <laughs> but please don't throw yours out. He, puts the, he does not put the constitution of the Republic of India. Did I say that correctly? Okay. He does not put the Encyclopedia Britannica. He does not put your medical texts. God puts one thing in your heart and mind, his law. You read Genesis and Revelation, he puts nothing else because that's all he wants. Because a white man said, that's the whole duty of man. Now, if God puts law in the heart, what does he want from the heart? Give me one word. Sure, brother, you're a handsome man. God bless you. Obedience. Obedience. If God wanted discussion, he would have put 10 proposition, 10 theories. He wants obedience, he put 10 laws. All he wants, obey me. But obey me from where? The spleen or the liver? From where? The heart. When you obey from the heart, how do you obey? Willingly. That's why he puts it in the heart. Tonight, Ask God to put his law in your heart so that you and I may pass what? The comprehensive test. Satan is the one who convinces us there is no law. Because he knows where there's no law, there's no one, no life. If we think there's no law, we think we're not sinning, we sin our way right to hell. My brothers and sisters, there is a law of life. It was used by Christ to create. It is used by Christ to maintain. And we are part of creation. And the system he set up before sin will be reinstated after this world is destroyed and a brand new world is made. I want a part of that world. Second Peter chapter 3, verse 13 says, Nevertheless, we, according to his promise, look for new heavens and new earth, wherein dwelleth righteousness. Righteousness is right doing by the power of God. How many of you will say with me, Father, please write your law of life on my heart. Can I see your hand? Write your law of life. Stand up with me. This is extremely serious. Let me ask you this. It's a very serious question again and also quite personal. Are you living outside of one of God's laws? Run down the 10 in your mind. Is there someone actively living outside of one of God's 10 laws? If you're living outside one, you're in danger. Because the law of God is like a cage that has 10 bars to protect us from Satan. How many bars need to be removed for Satan to get in? One. 
Thought from the Mount of Blessing, page 52, paragraph 1. In obedience to God's law, man is surrounded as with a hedge, a shield, and kept from the evil. He who breaks down this divinely appointed barrier at one point has destroyed his, protect, his power to protect him. For he has opened the way by which the enemy can enter to waste and ruin. The violation of one law throws open the gates for Satan to enter your life. Is there someone actively living in violation of one of God's command. I don't say someone making an occasional mistake. Some you know what you're doing is wrong. It violates God's law, but we do it. And tonight you want to say, Father, this message has opened my eye. I want to obey you. Give me the strength. Here's my question now. Is there anyone like that? Keep your hand up. God bless you from my heart. I'm not joking. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. Keep your hands up. Let's pray. Loving Father in heaven, it is not easy to respond to a appeal like this. Hands are raised to say we're actively disobeying one of your commands. Dear God, we've seen disobedience is death. Obedience through Christ is life. Christ set up a system based on law, and he will resume that system when the new, this old earth and the old heavens are destroyed. Father, disobedience brought death. A life of disobedience is a life of death. And so many of us, dear God, are living dead. Now, God, in mercy, look at those who raise their hands, those of us who stood to say, write your law in our hearts, and those who say, we're sorry, we have been in active disobedience for the sake of Christ. And because you love us, dear God, forgive us. Good put into us a love for obedience just a love for pleasing you and a hatred for disobedience bless everyone who came everyone who listened to god as we go home let us reflect on what we've heard and let us by the indwelling power of the spirit of christ live a happily obedient life so that when christ comes he may put us in a new world based upon law and command Please, God, touch our hearts. Write that law on our hearts that obedience may be done willingly and gladly. I offer this prayer from my heart. In Jesus' name, let all God's people say amen and amen. God bless you, my dear brothers and sisters. God bless you. The key to a happy life is to obey God. Simple. Obey God. Whatever he says, do it. Come back tomorrow and God will bless us again with his word.